Good morning. The uh, Committee on Science and Technology will come to order. Pursuant to notice, the committee meets to consider the following measures. H.R. 362, 10,000 Teachers, 10 Million Minds, Science and Math Scholarship Act. H. Conrad 76, honoring the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year. And H.R. 252, recognizing the 45th anniversary of John Herschel Glenn Jr.'s historic achievement in becoming the first United States astronaut to orbit the Earth. We will now proceed with the markup. Today we're meeting to mark up three bipartisan bills. I realize that I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but I sincerely hope that the Committee on Science and Technology is a place where members of both parties can come together to get work done on important issues in a bipartisan way. The important nonpartisan issue of this markup is competitiveness. This is one of the most critical issues facing our nation today. H.R. 362, 10,000 Teachers, 10 Million Minds, Science and Math Scholarship Act, which I sponsored and which my friend Ralph Hall co-sponsored, takes a big step forward in dealing with the vital issues. Together with H.R. 363, which this committee reported out earlier this month, these bills take the recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences rising above the Gathering Storm Report and turn them into real legislation that will make a difference. In addition to H.R. 362, we are also marking up two other bills. H. Conrad 76, a resolution honoring the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year, an international cooperative initiative that led to significant advances in space and earth science and which was marked by the dawn of the space age. H.R. 252 recognizes the 45th anniversary of John Glenn's historic space mission in which he became the first American to orbit the Earth. The space race of the 1950s and 1960s helped to drive scientific achievement and technological advance and innovation in the 20th century. And it's fitting that today, as we honor the scientific and technological achievements of the past, we're also helping to ensure this country's ability to make these great gains in the future. I recognize Mr. Hall to present his opening remarks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you, of course, as usual and as normal, uh, for calling this markup today. We have before us three measures, as you've stated, and a very important piece of innovation and competitiveness agenda that targets improving the caliber of our future K-12 math and science teachers and two space-related uh, resolutions. With regard to H.R. 362, I'm very pleased to see us considering the bill that has many of the elements that this committee passed last year. As I've stated before, I'm especially pleased to see that we're using the University of Texas UTeach uh, program for the basis for a scholarship program for STEM students who commit to teaching K-12 science and math classes after graduation. Now, I understand that there will be an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered H.R. 362, which includes agreed-upon improvements to the bill. Mr. Chairman, I really do thank you for working with our side, as you have always done, on making these improvements, not only to the underlying measure, but also with regards to H.R. 524, the Partnership for Access to Laboratory Science Act which I believe is also going to be offered as an amendment to H.R. 362. Okay, with that, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Hall, for your support of the bill, and more importantly, for your good additions to make a good bill even better. Without objection, members may place statements in the record at this point. We will now consider H.R. 362, 10,000 Teachers, 10 Million Minds, Science and Math Scholarship Act, and I yield myself five minutes to describe this bill. In 2005, the National Academies, I might add at the request of uh, Chairman Sherry Bowler and myself, assembled a blue ribbon committee to address concerns about the national prosperity and the global economy of the 21st century. This committee was chaired by Norm Augustine and was comprised of a broad spectrum of national leaders in academia, industry, and government. The committee's report was entitled, Rising Above the Gathering Storm, energizing and employing America for a bright, brighter economic future. That report, which was released in its present form just three weeks ago, presents recommendations that the nation must follow to maintain its competitiveness in a global economy. And what is the highest priority recommendation of the report? What did this distinguished committee tell us is most important for the future economic health of our nation? 
here is the first recommendation from the report, and I quote, increase America's talent pool by vastly improving K-12 science and mathematic education. And that's what H.R. 362 will do. The Gathering Storm report goes on to tell us where the focus should be in efforts to improve K-12 science and mathematic education. In brief, it says, focus on the teachers. And that is what H.R. 362 will do. The bill implements all the action items from the Gathering Storm report that the address report's first recommendation. The bill will create thousands of new teachers with uh, content and expertise in teaching in their area or their area of teaching uh, via the Norris Scholarship Program at NSF. The bill will create summer institutes and graduate programs that provide sustained content-oriented professional development to uh, teachers through math science partnerships at the NSF. And the bill will create centers for improvement of undergraduate education in STEM fields via the STEP program at NSF. To maintain our nation's high standard of living, we will need to sustain our world-class science and technology enterprise that creates innovative new products and high-paying jobs. To sustain this science and technology enterprise, we need to, a workforce that is prepared in a world-class math and science education system. But American students have performed poorly on an assortment of international tests of math and science achievement. That does not bode well for the future. That is the gathering storm on the horizon. To rise above it, we need to reform the math and science teaching uh, profession, and that is what H.R. 362 will do. The stakes are high, and the concern is urgent, and I urge support of this bill. And let me also put the uh, members on notice that this uh, this bill is supported by, you know, so many folks that it's really hard. And I'm I'm not going to go over all of them, but the business roundtable, the uh, okay, excuse me, uh, you know, every kind of math and science and education physics group that there is has, uh, and and this, and I'm just going to read you some of the ones that are sort of interesting. The American Society for Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. I mean, this cuts across a lot of folks. The business roundtable the Association of Community Colleges, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, uh, every kind of teacher group, the Semiconductor uh, Industry Association, there is just an enormous amount of um, support for this bill. And let me also say that when Norm Augustine first spoke to us, I mentioned to him that what he brought to us wasn't particularly groundbreaking. He didn't bring us any new ideas. All he did was take what we know and what has been told to us over and over and made a compilation. And this bill, my bill, is not very creative either. Uh, I even plagiarized the, uh, the name that he used, uh, 10, 10, 10 million teachers for 10,000 uh, or 10,000 teachers for 10 million minds. So we're not trying to break new ground here. We're just trying to act on what we know needs to be done. And I recognize Mr. Hall to present uh, any remarks on his on uh, any, any any of his remarks on the bill, uh, Mr. Chairman? I just once again want to thank you and your staff for working with our staff and improving the underlying bill. I yield back. Does anyone else wish to be recognized? I'm, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Robacher. Um First of all, let, let me have this this bill we're talking about basically provides scholarships for. Uh, uh, students who would then teach in uh, high school and, and other mathematics and science courses, is that right? Well, it does a couple of things. One, it does provide um, uh, competitive scholarships for students that will go into math, science, and education and agree to teach for five years. And agree to teach for right. five years. In right. addition to that, it provides stipends for existing math and science teachers to come back uh, to school in the summer and get their certification. The reason for that is it's amazing to think about this, but over 50% of the math teachers in K-12 to have neither a major or a certification to teach math. 92% of the physical science teachers have neither a major or a certification to teach math. So that's, you know, that's a big part of it. As Mr. Hall uh, uh, points out, we also use the University of Texas uh, uh, well-documented 
success in, in curriculum in trying to do this also. So that's the best of thrust. Well, as you know, Mr. Chairman, I've, I support the concept of uh, scholarships uh, in exchange for service, which I consider to be a, uh, a twofer and uh, something that, that would be uh, very justifiable. And I, I'm, I'm likely to support this legislation. However, let me just note that providing scholarships uh, is in reality, uh, another form of remuneration. I mean, this is what this is another form of providing a benefit for someone in order to pay them for a service. And uh, of course, I've tried to put that uh, to work uh, here for the federal government, NASA, and other people, saying that they can have scholarship programs providing for young people who will then work for NASA or that government agency. But in this case, when we're talking about public education, let us remember that as we provide this remuneration for science and math teachers, uh, it is because uh, we are having to do this, and the shortage that exists exists because of policies by the education establishment that all teachers, no matter what they're teaching, have to make the same pay. And overnight, this problem in our country could be solved if we simply uh, uh, stepped back from this policy and that the political uh, people in this country did not support this nonsensical theory that someone who is teaching uh, gymnastics in uh, sixth grade has to earn as much as a sixth grade science teacher or basket weaving or home economics or whatever that is that there are a lot of classes that can be taught. There's a lot of people waiting to teach social sciences in these schools, like history and other things, which, by the way, have a value to them. But right now we have a shortage, and we are not permitted to pay mathematics and science teachers more money, and that's why we have this shortage. Now, we're making up for that. This is, and I will likely, as I say, support the bill. But let's not forget that the fundamental problems being caused by a nonsensical policy that should be changed at the local level. And that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Robocker. I've heard your basket weaving speech before. Um, we don't have jurisdiction on that in this committee. Um, but we, this is a, for lack of a better term, I think a backdoor way to approach it. The five years is important because uh, half of teachers drop out in the first five years. And so there will be a mentoring program also to keep them there. But uh, thanks for your good comment. Is, does anyone else like to be recognized? Ms. Ms. Uli. Very, oops, thank you for turning on my mic. Uh, briefly in support of this legislation as a former teacher and also watching my children go through high school and how difficult it was to find particularly math teachers uh, in the high school level, people that were willing to teach math. Um, this has been a problem for a long time. And as we know, the Augustine Report um, says that this is an important thing to do. So I think we have to do this. I mean, we just have to increase that talent pool by improving K-12 science and math education. If we're going to maintain our front um, and it's on global innovation and technology, we have to get more students interested in the STEM fields. Our nation's economic vitality is derived in large part from productivity of well-trained people and the steady stream of scientific and technical innovations they produce. After years of inattention and neglect, this legislation is a critical first step towards reinvestment in our nature's STEM education. It will in turn positively benefit the American Competitiveness Initiative. And once again, I applaud the chairman for his leadership on this issue, and I urge my colleagues to support it. Thank you. Thanks for your hard work. Thank you. I didn't realize you were a teacher. What, what, what subject? Um, I taught high school, and I taught music, teaching, I mean, t reading, physical education, science. <laughs> well, <laughs> a, a, I was at a small school, okay? a, 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 a renaissance <laughs> and I couldn't history. decide what I wanted to do when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Bilbrey is recognized for five minutes. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, first of all, let me make a comment that Mr. Robacher and I don't agree on a lot of things, but 
I think in all fairness, even though it's not our committee. A lot of folks don't agree with uh, Dana on <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> Dana and my disagreements usually happen when we're out surfing, but that's a different story. But, I mean, we shouldn't just pass over his statement about the fact that the educational institutions have a, government has a quasi-monopoly on this range to such, you know, the monopoly is so large that there is an impact on this idea. And, and his concept of us at least raising the issue, we should raise it to our, our friends that are in, in the teachers associations and stuff about the fact that this one-size-fits-all salary um, just does not reflect the reality out there and they've got to rethink. And I think that we should be the voices in the wilderness to raise this, Democrats or Republicans. So I, I think he gets, I think he really has hit a good point that none of us want to talk about or think about, and I think if we really care about this issue, we at least got to be willing to broach that um, and raise that issue, and I, that's a huge leap, I understand. But going back to the, the original bill, one of the opportunities I think we've missed from learning from history is a great, the great contribution that the GI Bill made, um, not just to the veterans, but to the to educational institutions because they were taking people that were coming out of um, out of real world experience, not just walking out of educational institutions, and bringing that experience into the classroom with their degree to be able to teach. And I would really love to see us really understand and work with the with the veterans committee, which I happen to serve on, that looking at a GI bill that really encourages our veterans to go back into education. And, and, um, and then stay in education and get back in and teach our kids. Because I just think the benefit of education, of having people that have not just spent their whole life in, a, in the educational um, in, environs, really, really can be reflected in the successes that we had in the past, especially during the 60s and that period. So I would uh, I will support the bill, but I would just ask all of us to look at ways as we talk about taking care of the veterans that are coming back from this conflict one way they can, we can serve them and serve our children of the future is to try to ha formulate a strategy to get them involved in the educational institutions. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bilbrey, as we deal with other competitiveness issues and these types of issues um, uh, later uh, in this Congress, uh, when appropriate, uh, we, we would welcome for you and Dana or anyone else to, if, if, if you want to bring a witness, uh, uh, to be a part of a um, panel to discuss um, a disparity in um, salaries, uh, we would welcome you participating in, in that, in that and way. Mr. Chairman, let me clarify. I actually, you know, studied and wanted to be a history um, teacher, but I couldn't pull the academics, so I ended up getting stuck in Congress instead. <laughs> well, you're in good company. Mr. McNerney. Is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, the ranking member and all of uh, staff for putting together this bill. Uh, education is uh, dear to me. I have a PhD in math, and I have to say that those are some of the, the finest years of my life studying uh, mathematics and enjoying the beauty of it. And what I'd like to do is um, see that more young people appreciate not only the the power and effectiveness of mathematics, but also uh, and science, but also the beauty and uh, the power that this brings to your life. Uh, education is really an investment in our future, and education, the investment we put in education is, is paid back tenfold by the contributions that individuals that are highly educated and, and uh, appreciate that education contribute back to society. So it's not just uh, something that we remunerate, it's something that we invest, it's something that we get paid back for. Uh, and it's also a responsibility because uh, as we look at the educational performance uh, of our children, we see that they're uh, falling behind and that there are countries out there that are putting out this investment on their children and they're going to be uh, outperforming us in the future as uh, I know we're all aware of. I did make an effort to finish the uh, Rising Above the Gathering Storm and I, I'm really only about a third or halfway through it, but uh, I certainly see the need and I urge all members to support this bill. It's very important to our nation. It's very important to our future. Thank you. I yield back. Dr. Gingley is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I got here so early this morning, I just felt like I had to say a word or two. 
but in regard to the comments on on my side over here, Mr. Robacher and and uh, Mr. Bill Bray, I think they bring up a good point. But the the purpose uh, of the of the bill. Uh, and I would say that we really need to do both. I think we need to do uh, exactly what uh, uh, Dana had suggested. But in regard to this bill, I think what we need to keep in mind is we're trying to uh, rise above the gathering storm, Mr. Chairman, as you pointed out. And it's not just a matter of trying to improve uh, math and science, uh, engineering, education, uh, and giving uh, teachers an opportunity uh, incentivize them to do that and to go back into the classroom, but the purpose is to excite our young students uh, at the K-12 level uh, to go on and pursue a career themselves uh, in math and science and engineering. Uh, they themselves likely uh, might not go into teaching, but they go into industry and innovation and, and help this country rise above the gathering storm uh, so that's what it's all about, and I, I, Mr. Chairman, I commend you for it. It's a great bill, and I am fully supportive, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Gingrey. And let me also point out that the purpose of the, as you said, the purpose of the bill are, are, are to get those teachers that know their subjects so they can inspire uh, kids. But it is not just to create a few Dr. Ellers, you know, or, or in terms of uh, real uh, top-notch. Uh, investigative scientists, it's so that those folks getting out of high school can work at a higher level, can get a better job, can understand what's going on. I mean, that's what 95% of this is, is just helping everyday people be able to work more productively, get a better job. Anyone? Um, Dr. I just would echo that, Mr. Chairman. I uh, had a series of hearings, uh, actually meetings in my district two weeks ago with uh, members of the National Science Foundation. Uh, our superintendent of public instruction. I think the gentleman from California made excellent points about this, about the need for pay differentials. But your point about making sure people can get jobs, I spoke with a major employer prepared to invest a couple hundred million dollars in my community, bring 200 new jobs, but they lacked the ability to find people who could just add positive and negative numbers, do a scatter plot, calculate an average, understand what a standard deviation meant. That rudimentary knowledge was potentially costing us $200 million of investment and 200 new jobs. And it wasn't that the, that investment wasn't going to go somewhere. It was going to go somewhere. Those jobs were going to go somewhere. The question was, would they be in America or, or overseas? If we can't answer the question affirmatively that we have the human resources who are educated to do this kind of basic work, we will lose the jobs, we'll lose our competitiveness. And I applaud you for your leadership. I can tell you the people back home who employ uh, uh, students who graduated without adequate understanding of science and math applaud you as well. They are grateful to see this, that, that on a bipartisan effort we're coming together to solve this problem. I, I celebrate your work. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Baird. Let me, let me, again, let me say that all I did was plagiarize this report. And I think most all of you are um, are co-sponsors of this. So, you know, you're as much responsible as I am, and everybody should go home and take uh, credit for this. Are we co-plagiarizers as well? <laughs> that didn't work for Senator Biden a few years ago. I, we're acknowledging it. Uh, Dr. Ellers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few comments to follow up the earlier comments. First of all, it's apparent none of us are planning to run for, for president, so I think we can get by with plagiarizing. Uh, secondly, I was I was uh, somewhat relieved when when Ms. Hooley was giving the list of the things she taught that she didn't come up to basket weaving, or we might have had a little problem here. Uh, I also want to thank Dr. McNerney for his comments because what we really want to do in the math and science instruction is to have the students reach the point that he was talking about, where the subject, uh, the intrinsic beauty of mathematics and science becomes apparent to the student. And that's when they really begin enjoying it and start to consider it as a career. And it takes a uniquely qualified teacher to be able to bring that forward and to share that experience with the students. And that's, that's what we're all about here, trying to, to develop good teachers. And once they reach that point where they can share that beauty with the kids and enjoy it themselves, they are likely to stay in the teaching profession. 
in, in regard to the comments of uh, Mr. Rohrbacher, I have argued for years in my speeches that well, there should be a pay differential for the math and science teachers and perhaps for some others. I, I fail to understand why the largest, uh, one of the largest uh, institutions in our society should be expected to deviate from the norms of our society, which is free enterprise and entrepreneurship and payment according to ability and what one brings to the job. Uh, we, we, our entire economy is based on that precept. And yet we get into the schools, everyone's supposed to be paid the same. And part of it is uh, simply because the math and science teachers are badly outnumbered by the other teachers. And so you go with, uh, go with the crowd in a situation like that. And the easiest way is to pay everyone the same. No differentiation, no merit. And as a result, the good people tend to leave. The math and science teachers tend to leave because they can get a much higher salary. I think it's essential that we develop a, a different approach to the payment of teachers if we want to keep these teachers. The retention figures are horrendous, as, as the chairman well knows. And uh, especially the retention figures are horrendous for math and science teachers. And we simply have to change that. You have to meet the market in today's world. And that's what we have to do in the schools. So thank you. Thank you for bringing this bill forward, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be a co-sponsor. And uh, I can't wait to see the results of it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellers. You think we should extend that hearing to whether uh, members of Congress should be paid the same? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> since most of us didn't come here for the money, uh -huh. it's probably not a factor. But uh, I think pay differential would be good. <laughs> okay. uh, I understand that we're going to ha unfortunately have votes about um, up about 1045, and so we do want to try to. Ms. Weasley? Very quickly, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this good legislation, and of course I support it. But as uh, the mother of uh, Go Girl, uh, legislation to encourage young girls and young women and their families to uh, uh, put, keep them uh, in math, science, and technology when they're so good at it in the young ages. Uh, I believe now that it is beyond just girls. I mean, we can't leave out just 50% 50, 50 of our population and expect to catch up with the rest of, of the uh, world at all and, and uh, not have a flat economy in a flat world. But uh, I believe this goes beyond Go Girl. It goes in the right direction, and I'm totally supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woosley. And if, if I might, unless something is just burning at you, I would suggest that we try to move forward with this uh, a markup so that we so that it doesn't inconvenience you to have to come back. Is Eric, unless you want to say how it's going to affect Arizona? <laughs> oh, okay, we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. Okay. Uh, I, I ask unanimous consent that the bill is considered as read and open to amendments at any point and that members proceed with the amendments in the order of the roster. Without objection, so ordered. The first amendment on the roster is the chair's amendment offered in the nature of a substitute. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be in the nature of a substitute be treated as original text for purposes of amendment under the five-minute rule. Without objection, so ordered. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of... I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, <laughs> no offense, <laughs> uh, so ordered. None taken. I recognize myself for five minutes to explain the substitute amendment. This amendment, which has been developed in a bipartisan manner and which I offer with Ranking Member Hall, incorporates several small improvements to the original bill. The main changes make the following, and let me, I'm going to summarize this very quickly. Uh, uh, our, our Republican friends, as well as different folks uh, and outside groups, came to us with suggestions, things like the NOAA scholarship uh, should be, uh, have a five-year period rather than a four-year period. Basically, we have a number of these small little changes. I will be happy to go over them uh, and more you know, if anybody would like to, but it has been well vetted by the minority. So if there are no specific changes, uh, uh, then I will say, is there any further discussion to the amendment? Mr. Hall. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just once again want to thank you and your staff for working with our staff to improve the underlying bill. Uh, I'll give back to you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. The second amendment on the roster is offered by the gentlelady lady from Texas, Ms. Johnson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Ms. Amendment offered Once by... Once again, I ask unanimous consent to dispense <laughs> with the reading without objection, so ordered. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the committee for considering this important legislation. This amendment incorporates an important policy objective originating from my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Ruben Hinojosa, and Dr. Ellis joins me in, in uh, co-sponsor. Uh, who, he's not a member of this committee, however, he has uh, offered this several times. This provision is called the PALS Act, which stands for Partnerships for Access to Laboratory Sciences. And um, it exists independently as H.R. 524. It's supported by the American Chemical Society, National Science Teachers Association, and others. Uh, it would award grants to partnerships that uh, have a high a high need school, a college, or university, or a business, a nonprofit organization, uh, to the grant is to be used for teacher enhancement, laboratory equipment, curriculum development, and other elements to give high need schools what they need to lessen the uh, achievement disparities that currently exist. As a witness at the March 8th subcommittee hearing, um, there was testimony saying there are many schools in this nation who don't have science labs and many schools don't have teachers whose backgrounds are strong enough to do their jobs well. Uh, Dallas, Texas has quite a high needs uh, school, but we also have shining examples of successful partnerships. Townview is one of the best high schools in the nation. It is located in a high need area. Uh, the Townview Science and Engineering Magnet has its own electron microscope for student research and fully equipped engineering and robotics labs capable of college level experiments. Uh, in 1999, Texas Instruments, working with engineering professors at Southern Methodist University, helped design the first high school engineering course in the nation that incorporates the fundamentals of digital signal processing at Townview Science and Engineering Magnet in the Dallas Public School System. The partnership between TI and Townview enables students to see firsthand how science, math, technology come together to create cool products like Sony music chips. The project has been expanded and demonstrates impressive results in keeping students interested in technology careers. There are many other good things to say about Townview. It was listed as the number one public high school by several magazines last year. Uh, and TI has just been phenomenal in its support. So I request permission to submit this additional information to the record and ask for the adoption of this uh, amendment. Thank you. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Dr. Ellers, you are a major part of this amendment. Would you like to say amen? Uh, yes, amen. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, I'd like to say a little more, although since uh, you're concerned about the time, I, Dr. Ellis. I've been informed that uh, the that the vote is pushed back a little bit later than than uh, 10:45. So please. Fine. Uh, even so, I will uh, ask unanimous consent for the majority of my statement to be entered into the record, and I will try to summarize it. Uh, this is a bill that Mr. Enohos and I worked on and introduced last year, and we're pleased to see it incorporated into this section. 150 years ago, this bill would not have been necessary, perhaps not even 100 years ago, because most everyone lived on the farm, and on the farm you learned some basic ideas of mechanics and science. But today's world, we need laboratory science in the schools. Children have to have that experience. I personally think they should have it at every grade level from preschool through, uh, through grad school. Uh, this bill is an attempt to introduce lab science in the high schools, make certain that every student has an opportunity to experience laboratory science, to actually sit and do experiments with real equipment on real objects, and that is essential to their experience if they are going to continue in science and to thoroughly learn science. One other point I would mention, recent research by Carl Wyman, 
who's testi testified before this committee a number of times. He's a Nobel Prize winner from the University of Colorado, and he has done extensive research on this and is finding that simulations can also be a very effective way of teaching laboratory experience. So that's something I hope the National Science Foundation could pursue as well. But this bill will give teachers training, professional development on how to use laboratories, how to teach laboratories properly, and will provide some funding for it, particularly in schools without the means to have laboratories. So I, I uh, unanimously request the rest of the statement be entered into the record, and I strongly support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers. You are a great value added to this committee. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Uh, Mr. Hall is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief. I, I recognize the hard work that Mrs. Johnson and Dr. Ehlers have made in an area where NSF has real expertise or prioritized. Uh, I'd, I'd have preferred to have seen statutory language prohibiting federal funding from being used for the purchase of lab equipment and the maintenance of lab facilities in this amendment. However, uh, I appreciate the willingness of you to work with us and the majority to work with us to ensure that report language is strongly worded to emphasize its committee's intent for the non-federal partners to provide the funding for equipment and facility uh, maintenance and improvements. Uh, uh, I think that's something that would be very helpful. I yield back my time. Uh, Mr. Hall, you certainly have our commitment on that. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The third amendment on the roster is also offered by the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Johnson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes. The clerk, uh, will, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment I, I ask unanimous consent to dispense <laughs> with the reading without objection. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The amendment I'm offering today. Oh. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Excuse me. The amendment I'm offering today deals with Section 205 of H.R. 362. The section addresses the STEM talent expansion program called the STEP program. STEP aims to encourage colleges and universities to increase the number of STEM graduates at the higher education level, particularly underrepresented minorities. Grant funds may be used to promote interdisciplinary teaching, undergraduate research and mentoring initiatives, bridge programs to help students at community colleges transfer credits into the bachelor's program, and other important projects. The law is currently written so that NSF must, quote, strive to increase the numbers of STEM graduates who are women, minorities, and individuals with disabilities. Uh, this program is important because I live right in the midst of a number of needs. Uh, the majority of my constituents in Dallas are underrepresented in, in STEM fields. 20% of the public school student body have access to the school I just spoke of, but 80% do not, and uh, they need encouragement to make it through an education system filled with obstacles, no pipeline, and little hope. And my amendment would make a small addition to the text of Section 205 that would make a big difference to me and my constituents. And it states that in awarding grants for this program, the NSF director shall endeavor to ensure that a wide variety of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields and types of institutions of higher education, including two-year colleges, are covered. My amendment changes the language to say including two-year colleges and minority-serving institutions. Minority-serving institutions are historically uh, black, uh, black college and university, Hispanic-serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and institutions that serve Asian-American and Pacific Islanders and persons with disabilities. Hometown, exam hometown examples are Paul Quinn, uh, Texas College that Mr. Hall has served on the board, Texas Southern University, Loretta College, and there are probably over 50 minority serving institutions in Texas alone. My amendment calls greater attention to the minority serving institutions in an effort to give them a fair chance to apply for a STEP grant. As I said, Mr. Chairman, this is a small change and I encourage my colleagues to support this provision aimed at diversifying a highly skilled STEM workforce. And I might also add, Mr. Chairman, 
that's one of the reasons why I agree with Mr. Rohrbacher, because we have most of our teachers do not have a major in the subjects of which they teach. That does not speak well for the areas that we have the greatest need. I thank you very much, and I hope, I hope I'll get support for this amendment. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Would anyone else like to be recognized on that amendment? If not, I want to recognize myself for just a moment. You know, I think that every member of Congress brings different sets of experiences to Congress, and because of that, we're able to make better decisions. And those life skills, I think any type of group can make better decisions when you have a diversity of backgrounds. Um, and that's the reason when we tried to put together our majority staff that we reached out uh, to minorities uh, and to women. And I'm telling you, it, is, it was tough. We, we had a difficult time, and we did not do as good a job as I would have liked. And I think it is a real-world demonstration uh, that, uh, particularly within women and minorities, uh, that that is the greatest area for potential that we have in terms of boosting up those folks that want to go into these areas. And I think uh, this is a good amendment, and I uh, commend the uh, gentlelady for bringing it. And if there are no further discussions, uh, then all in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it, uh, and the amendment is agreed to. Thank you very much. The fourth amendment on the roster is offered by the gentlelady from Arizona. Ms. Giffords, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment, and I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Hall, for hearing this amendment. We all sat here just a couple weeks ago to hear from Norm Augustine and members of the panel that spoke about the rising above the gathering storm and the problems that we face. The National Science Foundation Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics Talent Expansion Program seeks to increase the number of students that are going to be receiving associate degrees, baccalaureate degrees, concentrations, and certificates in STEM fields. NSF provides grants to institutions of higher education to support certain activities such as student mentoring, interdisciplinary teaching, undergraduate research, and internships in order to achieve the program's goal. What I am offering today, Mr. Chairman, is to amend the STEM Talent Expansion Program. The current statute requires NSF to strive to increase the number of STEM graduates among women and minorities who are currently underrepresented in those fields, and I think we would all agree that's important. But what this amendment specifies is that NSF should also strive to increase the number of STEM graduates among students in secondary schools with high concentrations of children from low-income families. And the purpose of this, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hall, is to help increase participation in STEM fields of students in poor and rural areas and urban regions. The authors of the Gathering Storm Report stated that they're worried about the future prosperity of the United States. And I believe they meant the entire United States, not just certain areas. So we must increase our number of STEM professionals across the entire country. They go on to write that half of undergraduate students who enter college intending to earn a science or engineering major actually completed a major, as you so spoke earlier, Mr. Chairman, in one of those fields. Many of those students could have succeeded if they were given enough support in the early days of their undergraduate experience. So it's clear to me that we have to do more to help students who graduate from schools in poor rural or urban areas of our country. And the STEM talent expansion program can do just that. I think we all take seriously the challenges that we have before us as we try to lead in the 21st century. Again, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hall, my amendment will help students from low-income rural and urban areas get the support that they need as well to help pursue an education and a career in science, mathematics, technology, and in engineering, and I request the support from members on both sides of the aisle, so thank you. Is there further discussions for this good amendment? Mm -hmm. If uh, not, then all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The uh, fifth amendment of the roster is offered by the gentlelady from Arizona. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Hall. What I'm offering here is an amendment 
to the provision of H.R. 362 that authorizes NSF to support summer teacher institutes. It requires NSF to give priority to grant applications that propose programs that will attract teachers to the summer institutes from high-need school systems, that is, schools that have a high concentration of children from low-income family that are currently experiencing a shortage of highly qualified teachers. During this, Doing this will help train teachers from poor rural and urban areas to teach challenging courses in math and science, including AP and IB courses. Let me give you an example, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hall. I, w I have to talk about Arizona. I had an, an edu edu education summit out in Cochise County. My district is over 9,000 square miles. Most people recognize the city of Tucson, but there are many other smaller cities in my district, including a town called Visby, which used to be the big mining capital um, of Arizona and certainly of the West. We had a, um, one of the top five teachers in the state that came from Bisbee to testify about the fact that her top student that went on to the University of Arizona was told the huh. first week of classes that they would be skipping the first two chapters because they had received that in their AP biology course in high school. And she came before us and she said, we failed our student because this student said to the teacher, I don't know what AP is. The fact that in these rural areas they don't have the teachers that are qualified to be teaching these AP courses is something, Mr. Chairman, I think that we're all concerned about. The Gathering Storm report states that without fundamental knowledge and skills, the majority of students scoring below certain levels that we see around the country is going to provide for the lack of foundation for good jobs and participation across society. We know that low-income students, 70% of their middle school math teachers majored in a sub subject other than math in college, as you so spoke about, and these numbers are staggering. So again, getting back to the Gathering Storm report, it says very bluntly, and I think we take this seriously, accelerated math and science courses are less frequently offered in rural and city schools than in suburban ones. How to achieve an equitable distribution of funding and high quality teaching should be a top priority issue for the United States. My amendment, Mr. Chairman, addresses this head on. To remain competitive, we have to address all the country, all, all of the states and all of the areas in our country. I respectfully ask for support for my amendment. Thank you, Ms. Gifford, for your value added. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there other amendments? Uh, the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment, and I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman uh, from Missouri is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the things is a, a guy that's grown up in engineering, uh, I at least have a little bit of understanding of, and that is how fast science and technology moves in our world how that field is continuously changing and tremendously dynamic. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, the excellent bill that you have going here. And I am uh, very supportive of the section, uh, it's section 204, which says we're going to take a look at the good materials that uh, can be found and, and used and distributed to help get kids going in math and science. One thing that would scare me would be if we, we got to the point from a government point of view that we start to freeze everything and say, well, you got to do it this, that, or the other way. My amendment uh, simply says that the recommendations made under this section is not going to be considered some mandate for it has to be done just in a certain way. I think that was implied in the way it's written. I'm very supportive of it, and I really thank the uh, majority party for working with me uh, on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you, Mr. Aiken, for your value added. Let me just point out that we have a better bill today because it was vetted. Uh, the minority outside, different various folks have made uh, recommendations, and we've tried to alter it for that. Um, this amendment we just received minutes ago, and, uh, and, and we certainly we want to accept the amendment, uh, but it just makes everybody's job easier to have recommendations earlier so they can be vetted. But again, this is a good amendment and uh, we will accept it. Uh, is there anyone else? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Ehlers. Uh, just to comment on this and not to speak against the amendment, but just to clarify some of the issues. Uh, we, have a, we face a major problem in this nation because the people and the children are very mobile. 
and there's one area that we should have a national standard, although I hate to use the word standard, but that is in the sequencing of topics because math and science are sequential. And we get, get into a lot of problems because of the variety of math and science programs. Uh, let me give you a simple example. Suppose you have a student attending a school where fractions are taught in the fall, percentages are taught in the spring. In January, that student transfers because the family moves. He got, ends up in another school that teaches percentages in the fall and fractions of the spring. That student's going to get a double dose of fractions and will not learn percentages. Uh, there's much to be said for a national agreement. I hate to use the word standard, but a national agreement about the sequence in which subjects should be taught so that any student can be assured and parents can be assured that whenever they move, their student will fit right into the same sequence, even though it may be taught from a different te textbook. At least they will have the same sequence. And that's something that I'm working on separately, perhaps through No Child Left Behind. Uh, but I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say we do have a problem by not maintaining a, a national agreement on that. And we should, uh, should attack that problem. Thank you, Dr. Ehlers. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Dr. Baird. I would like to echo Dr. Ehlers' uh, uh, observation, and he and I have discussed this issue before. If you look at, uh, if you read the, the Rising by the Gathering Storm, they talk about at least exploring the possibility of a voluntary model national curriculum. If you look at many of the nations internationally who are exceeding our performance on math and science, in the later grades, they have precisely national curricula. We are, as Dr. Ader said, a tremendously mobile society. I have school districts in my district that have 40% turnover, uh, schools rather, individual schools, 40% turnover every single year. So when we look at AYPs and we look at No Child Left Behind, etc., you've got a school where 40% of the kids weren't here last year, meaning they didn't necessarily get the curriculum in sequence uh, that the other kids got. And every time a new child arrives in a new school, that school has to somehow assess where that child should be. Those kids fall out of the sequence of the other kids. There's tremendous inefficiency, and they often feel stupid. They feel left behind. They lack, there's a great word, they lack propedeutic knowledge. Propedeutic knowledge is the knowledge that you must have before learning something else. And if you miss that, you fall off the pace line, and I don't think we do those kids a service, and oftentimes I think those kids are often kids maybe from perhaps less stable families, lower income families possibly, who already have three strikes against them. And, and I don't necessarily, because I don't think it's the intent of the legislation before us today to establish a national curriculum, I don't see this as necessarily a harmful amendment, but I would certainly not endorse this if it precluded this committee from discussing the pros and cons of some form of standardized sequence of instruction in the math and sciences so that kids who move across this country, as they do many times, uh, can do so relatively seamlessly. There's got to be enormous expense to our hodgepodge approach to education in this country. Uh, an enormous inefficiency, and I think this committee and possibly the other uh, committees of jurisdiction might want to look at that. I know it's anathema to people who say, well, it's all about local control. I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest, I would guess 99.9% .9 of the people who advocate against a national standard couldn't name a single school board member in their local control jurisdiction, nor could they uh, tell you anything about the sequence of curricula. So we talk about local control as a shibboleth that nobody can, can raise any questions about, but I think if you look at the international competition, they have national curricula and they follow through that, and I think we ought to at least discuss that. Thank you, Dr. Beard. I, uh, council um, informs me that this is a very narrow amendment to a very narrow section that it would not stop uh, discussions or implementations of sequencing uh, or, for that matter, for general agreement as to how to proceed in a uniform uh, method. I respect that. And based on that, I certainly wouldn't oppose it today, but I would urge this committee to raise this as a possible question for our exploration, how 
just how diverse are our courses across this country, how frequently do students move across your uh, educational jurisdictions, what are the costs and benefits of that, and might we not be able to do a better job of, of uh, 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 meeting those students' needs. Just like uh, uh, for, to a great extent our parents got one job and stayed there, uh, our kids are in a much different situation. It's a much more mobile society, and uh, those are very good points that are raised. Are there further discussion? Yes, sir. I would like to just add, uh, as an educator by training and a practitioner for a few years, that I, I understand uh, the arguments being made. I also would like to suggest that uh, there could be a, a scenario where a fourth grade class uh, mastered fractions early on, and I would hate to see uh, a class held back from excelling even further because they're tied to a, a timeline where the uh, professionalism and very good judgment of a highly trained educator is disregarded uh, in entrusting that judgment of whether or not to move ahead. You know, if there's a new student who moves in, um, I can understand that, and teachers are trained to accommodate that. Uh, so I, I think we should, we should move cautiously when we look at these things, but certainly I do support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Are there other, does anyone else have discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All in favor say aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The vote is on the bill, H.R. 362 as amended. All those in favor will say aye. All those opposed will say no. Aye. aye. Excuse me, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. I recognize Mr. Hall to offer a motion. Mr. Chairman, I now uh, move that the committee favorably report H.R. 362 as amended to the House with recommendation that the bill as amended do pass. Furthermore, I move that the staff be instructed to prepare the legislative report and make necessary technical and conforming changes and that the chairman take all necessary steps to bring the bill before the House for consideration. The question is on the motion to report the bill favorably. Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported. Uh, without objection, the motion is reconsidered. Uh, to reconsider is laid on the table. Now I move that members have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplemental, minority, or additional views on the measure. I move pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 22 of the Rules of the House of Representatives that the committee authorize the chairman to offer such motions as may be necessary in the House to adopt and pass H.R. 362. 10,000 Teachers for 10 Million Minds, Science and Math Scholarship Act, as amended, without objection, so ordered. Let me uh, say that this is, and I thank all of you for your cooperation, this is a high priority for the House leadership, and my understanding this bill will be up uh, either the first or second week after we return from the recess, and again, I hope all of you will take um, uh, the credit you deserve. We now offer, we now will consider HCON Resolution 76, honoring the 50th anniversary of the International Global Physical Year. I yield Mr. Udall five minutes to describe his bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased that we're here today to mark up HCON Res 76, which is a concurrent resolution honoring the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year, also known as the IGY. Uh, the resolution marks the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year honors its contributions to space research and looks forward to future accomplishments. I want to thank uh, several of my colleagues from the Science and Technology Committee that joined me as original co-sponsors, and in particular want to thank Space and Aeronautics uh, Subcommittee Ranking Member Calvert, Chairman Gordon, and Research and Edu uh, Science Education Subcommittee Chairman Baird for their support. Uh, the International Geophysical Year of 1957 uh, 1958 was a highly successful international effort involving 67 nations that came together during the Cold War to coordinate global observations and measurements of the solid Earth, oceans, the atmosphere, and the near Earth space environment. Uh, during the IGY, successful launches of the first artificial satellites took place. 
Sputnik 1 by the former Soviet Union, and Explorer 1 by the United States, marking the dawn of the space age. Explorer 1 also enabled one of the most notable achievements of the IGY, the discovery of the belts of trapped charged particles in the Earth's upper atmosphere by the late Dr. James Van Allen of Iowa. I introduced a similar resolution of the in the 108th Congress, which passed the House to honor the IGY and encourage the celebration of its 50th anniversary throughout the country and the globe. This year's commemoration serves to not only remember the great scientific work that was done, done during this period, but also to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers who will be critical to our continued progress and economic well-being. In that regard, H. Conrez 76 encourages the public, and in particular our young people, to participate in celebrations planned for the IGY anniversary year and to embrace challenging goals for future research in earth and space science so that we will be able to look back 50 years from now on equally exciting accomplishments and discoveries. Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support this important resolution at today's markup in order that we may recognize and honor the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Udall. The chair recognizes Mr. Hall to present any remarks on the bill. Mr. Chairman, I don't think there's any disagreement on this committee that it's appropriate to recognize the 50th anniversary of the International Geophysical Year and all of its uh, contribution to scientific research. We passed this exact same resolution two years ago in anticipation of the upcoming International Polar Year, which has now arrived. I believe the point of the resolution then was to encourage participation in future IGYs. Well, we're actively participating now. I'm not uh, sure that I understand why we've chosen to omit any mention of the current IP why in this resolution as our committee has jurisdiction over the most prominent federal agencies participating in it. In addition to NASA, which this resolution highlights, the National Science Foundation, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Department of Energy are all very actively participating. In fact, NSF is the lead U.S. agency for this endeavor. Now, Mr. Chairman, I support this resolution because I agree with everything it states. However, I believe the current IPY also has the potential to have an even greater impact on our future. On a day when we're reporting innovation and competitiveness legislation, I feel it's only appropriate to also tip our hats to the current IPY that, quote, promises to bring about fundamental advances in many areas of science and to fire the enthusiasm of young men and women for careers in science and engineering. At this time, I'd like to yield Mr. Calvert to balance my time. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hall. I have uh, really no, no further comment other than the fact that uh, I'm happy to join uh, Congressman Udall as an original co-sponsor and uh, would encourage everyone's support and certainly share the comments. Of Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hall and Mr. Calvert. Does anyone else wish to be recognized? I ask unanimous consent. The bill is considered as read and open. Uh, to amendment and that any members that in members proceed with the amendments in the order of the roster without objection so ordered are there any amendments hearing none the vote is on the bill H con res 76 all in favor will say aye aye all those uh, opposed say no uh, in the opinion of the chair the ayes have it I recognize Mr. Hall for a motion Mr. Chairman, I move the committee favorably report House Concurrent Resolution 76 to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. Furthermore, I move that the staff be instructed to make necessary technical and conforming changes and that the chairman take all necessary steps to bring the bill before the House for consideration. Yield back. Question on the motion to report the bill favorably. Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye, aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. I move that members have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplemental minority or additional views on the measure. I move pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 22 of the Rules of the House of Representatives that the committee authorize the chairman to offer such motions as may be necessary in the House to adopt and pass H. Conrez 76, honoring the 50th anniversary of International uh, Geophysical Year. Without objection, so ordered. We will now consider H. Res uh, 252, recognizing the 45th anniversary of John Herschel Glenn, Jr., historic achievement in becoming the first United States astronaut to orbit the Earth. Can you believe it? It was 45 years. Uh, I yield Mr. Wilson five minutes to describe his bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be an original co-sponsor of House Resolution 252, which commends the accomplishments of John Glenn, an American hero from my state of Ohio. As a young man, John Glenn was dedicated military officer, flying 149 missions during two wars. In 1959, he was selected as one of the original seven astronauts in the United States space program. John Glenn's courage inspired the nation and paved the way for generations of space exploration. As a senator, he has helped build a safer world by co-authoring the Nuclear Nonproliferation Act. Since his retirement from the Senate, he's contributed in many ways to contribute to the greatness of America, especially by founding the John Glenn School of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University, which instills his values of courage, integrity, and service into the next generation of American leaders. As a member of the Science and Technology Committee and in Ohio, and I am very pleased to be a co-sponsor of this legislation honoring the 45th anniversary of John Glenn's orbital flight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I encourage my colleagues to support this resolution. I recognize Mr. Hall to present any remarks on the bill. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, House Resolution 252 honors the 45th anniversary, as you've stated, of John, John Glenn uh, Jr.'s historic mission as the first American to circle the Earth above the Mercury, uh, aboard the, the Mercury spacecraft Friendship 7. His mission completed three orbits around the Earth reaching an approximate uh, maximum altitude of 162 statute miles and an approximate orbital velocity of 17,500 miles per hour. This was truly a landmark event in the progress of our human spaceflight program and was important as a catalyst to space exploration and scientific advancement in the United States. These early successes captured the minds and the imaginations of people all around the world. After retiring from the space program, John Glenn continued to serve his country as a distinguished member of the Senate for 24 years. In 1998, John Glenn returned to space after 36 years as a member of the crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery, serving as a subject for basic research into the effects of weightlessness on the body of an older person. Uh, John Glenn is truly an American hero, and I yield back. And it's high time we start recognizing these old guys. I yield back. Mr. Hall, are you volunteering for service? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to volunteer the guy that's going to run against me for a space flight. <laughs> 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 well, this uh, this uh, uh, resolution will be on the floor as, as a suspension, and we welcome everyone that wants to come at that. If you any remarks now, but it would uh, clearly John Glenn is a very decent, yeah. courageous uh, uh, public servant. I guess to quote someone, uh, we're all uh, uh, Ohioans today because he is. We all. I mean, he's one. He, he's for everybody. So, uh, uh, Mr. Can, Chairman, can I tell you a story about Glenn, real brief? Certainly. He was tired and the campaign for president, came home all beat down, had a hard day, was going down in the rankings and everything, and came in. His wife was not just overly comforting to him, but his dog ran up and licked his hand, and he said, you know, when I come home, I ought to have at least two friends here. She bought him another dog. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Oh, Mr. Calvert, I, I, I just want to uh, certainly join in uh, our admiration of John Glenn, but I, I also want to point out another Ohioan, Neil Armstrong, and I think we're going to have an opportunity, hopefully uh, the later this Congress, to uh, recognize him also. So I hope we, uh, we take that opportunity to do so. We will, we will welcome that opportunity and uh, look forward to your leadership uh, in that regard. Anyone else? Will the chairman yield? Certainly. Does all this talk mean we have to be for Ohio State this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Any other, anyone else wish to make a comment? Uh, pertinent or not? Okay. If, uh, if not, I ask unanimous consent. The bill is considered as read and open to amendment at any point, and that the members proceed with the amendment in the order of the roster without objection, so ordered. Are there any amendments? Hearing none, the vote is on the bill. H. Res. 252. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. <coughs> I recognize Mr. Hall to offer a motion. 
Mr. Chairman, I move the committee favorably report House Resolution 252 to the House with a recommendation that the bill do pass. Furthermore, I move that the staff be instructed to make necessary technical and conforming changes and that the chairman take all necessary steps to bring the bill before the House <coughs> for considerations. I yield back. The question is on the motion to report the bill favorably. Those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The bill is favorably reported. Without objection, the motion is uh, to reconsider is laid upon the table. I move the members have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplemental minority or additional views on the measure. I move pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 22 of the Rules of the House of Representatives that the committee authorize the chairman to offer such motions as may be necessary in the House to adopt and pass H.R.S. 252, recognizing the 45th anniversary of John Herschel Glenn Jr.'s historic achievement in becoming the first United States astronaut to orbit the Earth. Without objection, so ordered. I won't, uh, let me again thank all your members today. This has been another, I think, productive markup, uh, bipartisan, nonpartisan, that I hope that everyone will go home and take credit for because you all deserve it. And I will see you on the floor uh, probably the first week uh, that we come back. And the committee is adjourned. Let's